Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is uh, great to be here, and I want to thank Will uh, for this conference and for Deloitte and Caterpillar and GE and all the great sponsors. I mean, we've been thinking about doing this event for the last three years, and finally got convergence to make it happen. You know, we have uh, three incredible conferences, uh, Exponential Medicine, how all these technologies are transforming medicine. We're doing it in finance, which will get massively disrupted, changed, reinvented. And the third place that we were absolutely just felt compelled to bring this together was manufacturing. Uh, and as you're going through these next two days, what I'd like you to think about is consider this event as it grows, and this is you know, just stage one. Consider this event the place that you come to to get a sense of what is going from deceptive to disruptive in the manufacturing field right now. So, let me jump in, I'll come back to that theme in a little bit. And my goal here is to provide some foundational information uh, upon which an amazing slate of SU faculty will be, will be adding. So I want to give you uh, a sense of why now is different. Why is this decade, the next decade, not interesting times, the most extraordinary times ever in human history, and they truly are. So I want to begin by having you understand a cognitive bias. And I know there are a number of you who are in uh, the SU family, XPRIZE, Abundance 360, members of the people who I work with. So you've seen some of this content. And I want it simply to be a reminder of, where, uh, of the mindset that you're stepping into these next two days with. So our brains, the wetware and hardware of our brains, physiologically, the way our brains are wired, the way we think, evolved in a very different time. They evolved hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago, back when the world was local and linear. And because of that, the way we think is local and linear. But today, we're living in a world that's global and exponential. Things aren't changing century to century or decade to decade. They are changing year to year, right? And things are not local. Something happens in China or India, you know about it seconds later, your computers know about it microseconds later. And this is fundamentally different than ever before. And you'll see this curve a thousand times in the next two days, because it's really important. That red line is us. It's you. It's your board. It's our customers. It's our children. It's our families. As humans, we are and have been linear thinkers. We haven't been increasing our capabilities, our cognitive capabilities, but that yellow line, that yellow line is what we're here to talk about over these next two days. It's computers, network sensors, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology. All of these technologies are doubling in power year after year. And the difference between these two lines is why you care, right? The difference is either going to be disruptive stress or disruptive opportunity. Because if you're the CEO of a company that's been doing it the same old way in manufacturing for the last 150 years, we're a proud family company, we've been doing it the same old way, guess what? It's going to be disruptive stress. If you're the CEO of a new 3D printing technology, and a new material process, whatever it might be, it could be disruptive opportunity. So I opened my last book, Bold, with the story of Kodak, which in one sense was a, you know, a process company uh, that in 1996, it was at the top of its game, a $28 billion corporation, 140,000 employees. And Kodak, most people don't know, 20 years earlier had invented the digital camera. They had invented it in their labs. A guy named Steven Sasson had put it together, and he walks into the boardroom of Kodak with this large, clunky device that takes 0.01 megapixel images in black and white recorded on a tape drive. And of course, the Kodak board says, are you kidding me? This is a toy for kids. We're Kodak. We make beautiful high-resolution images. And besides, we're in the paper and chemicals business. And they promptly ignored it. And in the same decade, uh, in 2012, Kodak files for bankruptcy, put out of business by the very technology that they had invented. They had the first intellectual property patents for. They had the first mover advantage. But they forgot what business they were truly in. And so one of the questions during these exponential times is for you to continue to think about what business am I truly in? How am I serving my customers? Because the way you serve your customers, the plant facilities that you've invested millions or billions of dollars in may be obsoleted faster than ever before. And how do you remain agile? Agility is going to be one of the key takeaways you need to be thinking about. In the same year that Kodak goes bankrupt, 2012, another company, also in the digital imagery business, 
gets acquired by Facebook for a billion dollars, Instagram. But they've got 13 employees. Now, I've given this moment in time where a linear thinking company gets displaced by exponential technology, a name I call it the new Kodak moment. And I believe there are going to be a lot of new Kodak moments in the manufacturing world. How we build our houses, how we build our fittings, how we build our cars, how we build everything. And the same day that Twitter goes public, bank, uh, Blockbuster goes bankrupt. And you know, the stat from the old school of business that in the next 10 years, 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies will no longer exist, only backed up by this stat from Yale, which says if you started a company in the 1920s, the rate of change was rather slow. You know, you had 67 years on the S&P 500 before you were disrupted. Today, you get an S&P 500, you're on it for 15 years. You know, it's MySpace disrupted by, you know, uh, by Facebook, disrupted by Snapchat, or whatever's next. And what we're also seeing, and this is the, this is the challenge, this is the excitement, is we're seeing young entrepreneurs going from, I've got an idea, to I run a billion dollar company faster than ever before. Right? Chad Hurley starts YouTube on his credit cards and sells it <clears throat> to Google for $1.6 billion 18 months later. Uber, I mean, you could not have conceived of a couple of guys literally building a company, never buying a car, displacing you know, half the taxi fleets, rental car company fleets, and being worth $67 billion inside of five and a half years. So when we talk about exponentials, that is what's going on differently right now. And you saw this in Will's charts, but again, we don't intuit this. We don't think about this. We, as humans, I have two five-year-old boys, and right now, you know, they're learning their basic maths. And it's, you know, one, two, three, four, five. I'm a linear thinker, and five steps, I'm five meters away. And 30 steps, I'm 30 meters away in the back of the room. But that's not the world that we're building. The world that we're building is an exponential, where the power of the technology is doubling. It might be every year, 18 months, 24 months, it doesn't matter. That doubling power leads to unexpected results, because in 30 doublings, I'm a billion meters away. Put differently, I've gone around the planet 26 times. And that disconnect between I'm 30 meters in the back of the room, or I've orbited planet Earth 26 times, is what got Kodak in, pro in trouble and what's going to get any company that's not really surfing on top of the tsunami crushed by the tsunami. It's the reality of the world that we're living in today. So I'm very proud. We have an amazing group of, uh, of companies that are backing Singularity University. Uh, Ray and I co-founded this because there was no place in the world that you could go and learn about all of these areas in a convergent way. I spent 10 years across the uh, Charles River at MIT uh, and at, at Harvard Med School getting the best degrees I could, a six-pack of degrees to get me to become an astronaut. But at the end of the day, you become the world's expert in a very narrow niche, right? You're in particular material science, in a particular you know, uh, plasma genome, whatever it might be. But what we're trying to do here at SU is something very different. It's not about making you an expert in any one of these technologies. It's about consistently giving you an overview of where these technologies are today and where they're likely to go. Now, I started by saying we can't think exponentially, and we can't. Our brains aren't wired that way. The best we can do is make short-term linear projections. And so what SU is about is creating a venue like this one for you to come back, hopefully every year, every two years, whatever you want, and get an update. This is the world today. And then a year from now, this is what's now possible, and then this is what's now possible, because that's the only way we can do serial approximations to the kinds of growth we're having. We run programs for graduate students. Uh, we have uh, thousands of graduate students around the world. We run executive programs. We run programs with Deloitte and XPRIZE called IPP for Fortune 200 corporations. Now, all of this exponential growth, at least in the computational realm, is riding on top of what we call Moore's Law. And I want to just give you a sense physically uh, and at a gut level what this is. So this is Gordon Moore. Uh, and in 1958, Gordon Moore partnered with a few individuals and started Intel. In 1965, seven years later, he writes this paper and he says, you know, at Intel, 
we've noticed something. The number of transistors that are able to fit on an integrated circuit has approximately doubled every 12 to 18 months for the last seven years. And it's likely to continue. And that statement that it's likely to continue has continued for 50 years. It slowed down a little bit from 12 months to 18 months to 24 months, but it's been a constant force of nature. And take a look at what that looks like. So on this chart, on this graph over here, you see two uh, bars, a horizontal bar and a vertical bar. This is the first two transistors connected. It's an integrated circuit, half-inch feature size. Fast forward to 1971, this is Intel's first commercial product, the Intel 4004. 2,300 transistors, about a buck each. Now, my mom used to say that the world is speeding up. And I was like, come on, Ma, that's ridiculous. But the fact of the matter is, this is what's made it speed up. Right? 40 years later, the 2012 NVIDIA graphical process unit is now 7.1 billion transistors at a millionth of a penny each. So 100 billion fold improvement, which is extraordinary. Right? But guess what? It doesn't stop here. It continues on beyond this. Let me give you another visual representation. In 1956, this was a hard drive. And if you had the ability to you know, get your cargo airplane and move your hard drive from location to location, you were in good shape. Five megabytes, $120,000. Now, we probably all noticed when this occurred, right? When 2005, it's 128 megabytes for 99 bucks. But did we notice when it was all of a sudden 128 gigabytes for $99. A thousand-fold price improvement right on schedule on Moore's Law. 30 million-fold price improvement. And guess what? Again, it doesn't stop here. Now, I'm advising companies that are working on a million-fold improvement in memory densities. So the question is, can this growth go on forever? Because that's what we're here to talk about. It's, it's you know, I would posit that 3D printing is at its early stages still. Right? We are beginning to see incredible disruptive capability. I mean, you live in a $10 trillion industry that's going to be reinvented over the next 20 years. So the question of can it go on forever is a yes and a no. Now, this is what we see as what I call the deceptive phase of exponential growth. Right? In the beginning, you see very slow phase. It hits a knee of the curve and it explodes, and then it uses up the available resources, and eventually it sort of falls off. It's a technology S-curve. We see this all over the place, in all kinds of technologies. We see this as bacteria growing on a Petri dish. But the challenge is that it doesn't stay that way, because as Ray Kurzweil, my partner, talks about the law of accelerating returns, we use one technology to build the next technology to build the next technology. Right? So the very first computers were relay-based, and then we went to vacuum tube, then we went to transistors, integrated circuits, and we built them, and they looked like a continuous process. And so we had this continuous exponential curve. So yes, Moore's Law will run out, but something else will supplant it. So the question is, have you seen this before in your life? And you have many, many times. You just don't necessarily remember it. So make sure the audio is up on this. Of course, it's followed by, you've got mail. <laughs> I remember those days. It's like it's adrenaline rush. <laughs> Dial-up, right? How, I mean, that wasn't so long ago. And we became spoiled by you know, DSL, and then by cable modems, and by fiber optics. And this continues on and on and on, over and over again. So you know, what, you know, where are we seeing this kind of growth? We're seeing it all over the place. Uh, sensors, this is that guy, Steven Sasson at Kodak, who came up with the first digital camera. This clunker, 0 0.01 megapixels, 10,000 bucks in parts, four pounds. And of course, here's the digital camera today, 10 megapixels. It's a billion fold better. But guess what? Again, it doesn't stop here. It continues on, right? Because there are companies working right now to make these imaging systems, you know, microscopic bug eyes woven into your clothing and micro drones in the air. This was the first inertial me measurement unit. It got us to Earth orbit, got us to the moon. Tens of millions of dollars, tens of pounds. Today, it's a buck on your phone. Soon, it'll be molecular in size. 
built into everything you manufacture. The first GPS, remember this guy, $120,000, 53 pounds. Imagine this on the dashboard of your SUV. And of course, it's a couple of bucks now on your phone. So as I teach this, and this is to you as the CEOs in the room, I want to give you a conversational vocabulary that we use at Singularity University called the six Ds of exponentials. It's the notion that anything that becomes digitized enters a period of deceptive growth, then it becomes disruptive, then it dematerializes, it demonetizes, and it democratizes products and services. And let me break this down for you because I think it's, this is the roadmap I use and I think about in every company I've started, in 17 companies. I'm constantly looking at how do I dematerialize, demonetize, and democratize my products and services? Because if I'm not doing it, someone's doing it to me. So let's begin with deceptive and disruptive. Right, here is the human state of condition, the red line. Um, again, the best we can do is support our linear thinking by updating it constantly with exponential updates. Up there, that 0 0.01 megapixel was the first digital camera. And the next year, that camera was 0.2, and then 0.4, and then 0.8. The guy who ran digital at Kodak actually works for me at the XPRIZE Foundation. And I love hearing the inside stories about what was going on there and how it was being ignored. But in the deceptive days, it all looks like zero. I mean, it's really hard for the human brain to say, oh, yes, we're in exponential growth. We're 10 steps away from 100%. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You know, and if I said to you, you know, we all know about uh, 3D printing. How many folks had heard about 3D printing five years ago? Raise your hand. How about 10 years ago? How about 20 years ago? How about 30 years ago? Okay. It's a 33-year-old technology. Right? Chuck Hall invented stereolithography 33 years ago. It's just been in deceptive growth for a long period of time. And now it starts hitting the knee of the curve. And then all of a sudden it becomes disruptive. And so we're here to bring to you at this event every year an understanding of what's going from deceptive to disruptive. Because either you're the disruptor or the disruptee. It's just the way it is when things are growing that fast. When in 10 steps, you're a thousand times better. And in 20 steps, a million times. And 30 steps, a billion times. Don't have time for sort of like a deliberation, like do we experiment? Of course you do. Okay, the next D is dematerialization. And it's the notion that 20 years later, all of these things fit in your pocket. Right? I don't carry a GPS or a HD camera or a video camera or a flashlight or any of this stuff. It all fits in my pocket. And so my question is, which of your products or services are you dematerializing? And you're like, oh, I'm in the construction business. Yeah, well, guess what? Airbnb is dematerializing hotels. And you know, Uber is dematerializing cars. So we are dematerializing things over and over and over again. It's how you take in the sharing economy unused assets and repurpose them very effectively. Because when you do, because when you make them digital, the marginal cost of replication and distribution is effectively zero. And they are demonetized. Right? Uber is demonetizing the taxi fleet, Skype long distance, Amazon bookstores, Google research, Airbnb hotel chains, and Craigslist decimated the newspapers. Took the money out of the classifieds, put it back into the pockets of the consumers. So again, as the leadership of your company, which of your products and services are you dematerializing and demonetizing? And don't tell me you can't be done, <clears throat> because there's some element, some aspect of what you do that can be. And when you do, the benefit, of course, is you democratize. All of a sudden, you can reach a billion people in Africa. Right? If I wanted to reach a billion people in Africa, I would have had to have been Mutar Kent at Coca-Cola or Jeff Immelt at GE with arms and legs in 30 countries. Today, I can be a kid in a garage with a great internet connection. Your domain of your sales marketplace is no longer you know, Medford, Mass, or the United States. It's the world. So I posit that the manufacturing industry, especially through digital manufacturing, 
is going to enter a period of rapid dematerialization, demonetization, and democratization. How are you part of that? All of this is being driven by this curve. You'll see this a hundred times. Please take it in each time. <clears throat> we don't see World War II. We don't see you know, the Great Recession or the boom time. We don't see anything. We're using faster computers to build faster computers to build faster computers. And it continues. And when it does, you get this, right? 2010, the average $1,000 computer from Best Buy was now calculating at 100 billion calculations per second. More computational power than the US government had in the 60s and 70s, getting us to the moon. Seven years from now, the average $1,000 that you go down to Best Buy, if they still exist, and purchase a computer with, is now calculating at the rate of the human brain, 10 to the 16 cycles per second. And 25 years later, now it's calculating at the rate of the entire human race. Now your job gets really fun. <laughs> so what we're talking about here is the notion that faster, cheaper computing power, which is almost a force of nature, is driving a whole slew of technologies. We have an incredible faculty that I'm so proud of here at Singular University who are going to be talking about networks and sensors and AI and robotics and 3D printing, synthetic biology, you know, nanomaterials, VR, AR, all of these technologies. And any one of us could become an expert in one of these areas, maybe two. But that's not the game we're playing here. It's the fact that these areas are recombining in unexpected convergent mechanisms and consequences. Right? It's the coordination of AI and sensors and 3D printing coming together. It's really about in, how do I turn the intentions in my mind into a physical manifestation with skipping all the stuff in between. You're going to be hearing next from Neil Jacobstein, uh, who I have great admiration for, talking about this in the manufacturing world. Right? It's going to be an AI that is able to source, create, solve, answer, just what is your desire? I mean, this is almost a godlike view of the future. You know, Arthur C. Clarke said, any technology far enough advanced looks like magic. Well, AI is going to be magic, especially in the digital manufacturing world. One of the implications of all of these exponential technologies is a book called Abundance, which Neil gave me the title for. And uh, Ray Kurzweil gave me the subtitle for The Future is Better Than You Think. And I was very proud this book did really well. And about two years ago, I was on stage with President Clinton um, introducing me as the closing speaker at CGI. And as he brought me up on stage, he said, Peter, why are you so positive about the future? Don't you watch the news? And I said, President Clinton, I'm positive about the future for two reasons. One, I look at the data. And then second, I don't watch the news. <laughs> And, and the fact of the matter is, and I'm on every stage speaking about this because I want to sensitize uh, you to it, that we evolved on the savannas of Africa hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago, back when the world was a dangerous place. And we evolved a piece of our brain, a piece of the temporal lobe called the amygdala, that takes everything that we see and everything that we hear and processes it first, looking for danger. Like, it hears some rustle in the leaves, and the amygdala thinks, it's a lion, not the wind. Because 100 times, that would save your life. And the fact is that the news media takes advantage of this hard wiring in our brain. And I like to call the news media a drug pusher. And their drug is their negative news. And so the fact of the matter is that, <clears throat> you know, it's not what the news media is reporting isn't true. It's that it's not a fair and balanced view of the world. We pay so much more attention to negative news than positive news, right? There's no one standing outside Logan this morning going, there was no plane crash here today. <laughs> no one standing outside local school saying, no school shooting here today. You only hear about it when these devices get distributed around the world. Every single problem, every single hardship can be reported to you in high definition in your living room over and over and over again. So we have this, this somewhat uh, dystopian view of the world as brought to us by the news media. And I'd like to close in the last few minutes here by giving you a sense that we truly are living in the most extraordinary times ever. And the manufacturing industry is critically important to that. The fact that I can get 
anything I want at any time, almost any place on the planet, is unbelievable. It truly is, right? And I think about technology as the force that takes what used to be scarce and makes it abundant. And that's what you do. You take something that used to be scarce and you make it abundant. So I'll, I opened my first book, Abundance, with a story. The year is 1840. And Napoleon III is at the Palace of Versailles, and he's invited the King of Siam over for dinner. And the King of Siam is the highest state royalty coming. And to show how rich Napoleon III is, he feeds all of the troops with silver utensils. Napoleon himself eats with gold utensils. But the King of Siam is fed with aluminum utensils. Because in this year, 1840, aluminum is the most precious metal on the planet. In that same year, the Washington, <clears throat> excuse me, the Washington Monument is uh, being finished, and the capstone is made of aluminum. Even though the Earth is 8.3% aluminum by weight, all the aluminum is, is bound with silicon and oxygen to make uh, this brown-like material called bauxite. And it was so energetically difficult to extract pure aluminum out of the bauxite, it was worth more than gold and platinum. And then in the US and in France in the same year, the process of electrolysis was invented that was able to extract the aluminum with so cheaply, so easily, we use it like a throwing material today, right? Uh, I love this. It's one of the companies that I advise in the Bay Area. You know, what could you think of as more scarce than perfect large diamonds? You know, five carat, six carat diamonds. There's a company called D-Foundry that has methane, water, and electricity come in one end and perfect diamonds coming out the other indistinguishable from perfectly mined diamonds. So what do you think of as scarce? Let's look at the data to close this out here. This is a look at a chart from the cover of The Economist that we're heading towards the end of poverty. There was a report in the New York Times yesterday that we are at a 25-year low for famine on planet Earth, right? We're heading towards a time where we're going to elevate and take everybody out of extreme poverty and truly give us a world of abundance. This is the number of democracies, gone from a handful in 1800 to nearly 100 today. This is from Steven Pinker's book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, in which he says, listen, we're living during the most peaceful time ever in human history. No matter what CNN, the crisis news network, or the constantly negative news network, whatever you call CNN, is telling you these days, right? if you look at the world as a whole, this is the safest time ever to be alive. This is global reduction in children per family. In the 1950s, over 100 countries on planet Earth had more than six children per family. Today, it's plummeted. My friends in Silicon Valley are worried about underpopulation of planet Earth, not overpopulation of planet Earth. You make a country better educated and healthier, it drops. Bill Gates has a great TED talk on this story. Worldwide life expectancy, for most human history, 26 years old, <clears throat> was sort of like what an adult male would achieve. Anybody here under 26 in the audience? <laughs> Very few. <clears throat> then came germ theory, better sanitation, we doubled it, cardiovascular. And during this next 10 years, I truly believe we are going to double the human lifespan once again. Our goal is to make 100 years old the new 60. This is annual hours worked per week per person. You know, and I, I know this isn't true for you, <laughs> but for all, all of human history, while the quality of life has gotten better on almost every possible account of luxury, of of number of TV shows, of you know, foods, of materials, of what you could buy, we have halved the hours we've worked. We forget how brutal it used to be. I mean, working 80 hours a week to survive. Automotive accidents are in the blue. When we get autonomous cars, we'll go from 35,000 United States down to zero, right? 1.3 million around the world down to zero. You'll hear Brad Templeton speak about this. Here in orange or red is airlines, right? We've learned. It's amazing how we've made transportation so extraordinarily safe. I love this. This is annual global death rates. If you look at this, 
in the 40s, 50s, all of a sudden, death rates from epidemics, from storms, from floods, from earthquakes, from droughts, starts to plummet. What happens? Our ability to predict these things gets better, <clears throat> and our ability to actually get help where it's needed instantly improves. It used to be dangerous to be a mom. This is maternal mortality rates have plummeted. So why is this happening? Why now? It really is the impact of the technologies that we're speaking to you here about. This is why the world is changing. This is why we're heading towards this extraordinary age of abundance. Here are the numbers, right? This is bandwidth. I mean, it used to be expensive. I remember one of my internet startups in 1999. My number one cost was bandwidth for transmitting uh, video. Today, it's effectively free, right? This is computing performance. 220 bucks for a million transistors down to six cents. This is storage costs, 600 bucks down to zero. And I want to close with this um, slide. Uh, I have three more slides, actually, but close this part, which is the cost of launching a company. Really important here. How many startups are in the room? Just pure startups. So this is a, a small number. This is really for the, for the more traditional players. In 2000, when I started that internet company with bandwidth costs, the average cost for a startup was $5 million. <clears throat> it was $5 million for the bandwidth, really expensive, for the servers, for the software, for the people, all of that stuff to really get a good internet company up and going. Then enter open source, then enter AWS and cloud, and now we're down to 5,000 bucks. For 5,000 bucks, you can stand up an internet company and sell something. Now, it's a thousand-fold reduction in cost. Do you know what accompanies that? A thousand-fold increase in attempts. It isn't that these amazing startups creating these you know, billion-dollar overnight successes are smarter than anybody here in the room. They're not smarter than me. They're not smarter than any of us. It's just that there are a thousand times more attempts on goal. And because of that, you can still have 990 failures and 10 unicorns coming out of it. And so ultimately, your goal, your mission, is to learn how to experiment with this stuff. Right? Really important. And this is what's going on in the world that makes it even more important. This is the world's population, just crossed the 7 billion mark. This is internet penetration, 1.8 billion people connected in 2010. The low estimate for 2020 is 5 billion connected people, which means 3 billion new consumers who've never bought your stuff are coming online. Are you selling to these three billion new minds or not? But that's the low end of the estimate. Because Zuckerberg and Google and Musk and Branson and Paul Jacobs are working on capabilities to connect every single person on the planet. Not like you and I were connected at 96 or a bot on AOL, but imagine 8 billion people on planet Earth connected with a megabit per second connection, with access to the world's information on Google, the ability to spin up a thousand processor cores on AWS, the ability to you know, cloud print whatever they want. If you thought the rate of change was fast, you haven't seen anything yet, right? What are these people going to create? What are they going to invent? What are they going to desire? What are they going to discover? It's tens of trillions of dollars. And for the global manufacturing industry, this is important. These people are going to build stuff. They're going to want stuff. A pleasure. I thank you for your time and for your energy. I wish you an amazing experience here. I hope you'll come back year after year to really learn to appreciate what we do at Singular University. Thank you.